Yes, a career in ruins. Well, it's a certain kind of ruins that I specialize in. Uh, it's Roman ruins. So I present myself as a, an archaeology of the, uh, a, a scholar of the archaeology of the Roman Empire, and that's what you see in front of you. But I must um, also explain that uh, this is a little, um, a little taste of the past as well, because you're getting a nice treat in, um, in 20th century technology, because I'm using slides and not PowerPoint. And I was just uh, explaining to Judy that my entire career as a teacher began at the very beginning of the carousel um, projector. <laughs> and it ended at the end of the 20th century when PowerPoint was becoming the way in which students presented their, um, their project and so forth. And so I coincide entirely with the, I, and I remember the day when I saw the first slide, uh, 45 millimeter slide. I was in my last year as an undergraduate, which would have been 1957, and uh, my professor, um, Michael Goff, who had been using the large projector with the big glass slides, the way that s slides were illustrated before, with the um, archaeological lectures were illustrated previously and there was a tiny little projector about a quarter of the size on the table and he announced that he had a treat for us today and so he switched it on and there was the Parthenon in colour we had not seen it in colour in any f of the slides that we had seen previously and uh, then he explained this was a new size of slide and so forth and that this was the wave of the future. And then two years later when I came to Manitoba, which was my first uh, appointment in Canada, uh, I was brought in to introduce classical archaeology to the classics department. And, uh, and of course I needed slides, they had no slides of anything that I wanted to use, so my first year much of my days and nights were spent huddled over the uh, copy stand copying slides to, for each lecture and it was hardly a lecture ahead as the, as the year went on. Uh, but it was the Kodak carousel that had just arrived. It was, this was the first one that was, I think, on the campus. And then, of course, by the time I was finished, um, Already the PowerPoint was in full blast. The students were using it for their presentations. So that's what you're getting uh, tonight. First of all, I, what I want to do is just to show, take you through all my experiences of the Roman Empire and my teaching in archaeology. Um, sites that I have visited, sites that I have excavated or been involved in excavating. Uh, I just want to emphasize the size of this empire and when I look at it I can confirm that I've visited a very large number of the provinces with the different colors that are shown there. Um, but I'll, con I'll be concentrating on those places where I've actually been uh, working. So we'll move on to the next one, see if everything works correctly. Oh no, I think I've gone back, so that's all right. That's the one to press. Yes, so we start off, I'm going to start off at the very beginning, even before I was born, because I think my genes contain archaeology. And I'll explain how. Um, I obviously, by birth of Scots, uh, Scots from Scotland, and... Um, and from the very heart of Scotland, in fact, central Scotland from Stirlingshire, which is right in the centre, a very important royal city. Um, and I'm going to explain how, um, from the very beginning, I was steeped in the archaeology of Roman Scotland. But I'm showing you here the border between, well, not the border between England and Scotland because it's further north, but what you see here is, many of you will recognize, as Hadrian's Wall, that 
World Heritage um, Monument that strides across the Northumberland Moors, separating the barbarians of the south, who were being <laughs> Romanized, <laughs> from the barbarians of the north who were as yet un-Romanized and were, did not take kindly to being Romanized because they never were really uh, part of the Roman Empire. They were for a period of about 20 years. They were successfully um, uh, encased within the Roman Empire. But everything, eventually the Romans gave up on what was north of the Hadrian's Wall and uh, that south was Rome and what was north was uh, in Barbarico, uh, was in barbarian country. i just show you how it was um, it constructed. It was a stone wall with forts and mile castles and signalling towers at intervals, uh, employing a very large um, contingent of the Roman army, uh, several thousand men, in fact, to um, police it, and it's a very complex, um, you're only seeing the wall, but there were other features to it. It doesn't show any of the camps or the forts. But we come now to Scotland, and as I say, the, 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 front, the frontier, the Roman frontier, runs across uh, the north of England, my, yeah, there we are, uh, along that line there, from the Solway Firth across to the River Tyne, along the line of the River Tyne on the east side, uh, enclosing that part. So there's a bit of England outside, most of Northumberland, in fact, is outside of um, uh, the wall. When they invaded Scotland, they thought that a, f a fantastic uh, and manageable um, line would be a line across between the Firth of Forth, the upper waters of the Firth of Forth there, and the upper waters of the Firth of Clyde. And the Emperor Antoninus Pius, who succeeded the Emperor Hadrian, who had um, instigated Hadrian's Wall, uh, Antoninus Pius was something of a wimp. He had no military career at all at, at his back, and so he was somewhat defensive um, about his status. He didn't have any military experience. And so he undertook the conquest of the north to complete what Hadrian had um, left undone. And so there was a campaign and they even got the length of constructing a wall across the 37 miles between um, the Firth of Forth and the Firth of Clyde. And right between these two is a, a fort, there are many forts, because just like Hadrian's Wall, there are whole, in fact, there are even more forts because they, they had a fort every few miles instead of the mile castles. They got, they, they, they got rid of the mile castles and, and they had they garrisoned it with a whole series of forts along its length. And right in the center of that was where my um, ancestors had a farm, um, at least for two centuries. And so we lived on the outside of the wall. So we were, we were, I'm proud to say, in Barbarico by about a one mile. <laughs> and that's where my, uh, an uncle of my grandfather got involved in an attempt by the um, Archaeological Society of Glasgow to um, excavate and examine and write up, produce a full report on the Antonine Wall, which runs from the headwaters of the Firth of Forth here, more or less where the river enters the, the sea, and the um, headwaters of the um, estuary of the Clyde as well. And so you can see it's a very short line indeed, 37 miles. And of course, it's, you can see all the tribes. This is based on a map that was produced uh, in the reign of Antoninus Pius by um, the great scientist Ptolemy. He was a geographer, he was an astronomer, he, he was a brilliant man, a Greek astronomer who lived in, um, in Egypt working in the library at Alexandria. And his map of Scotland, I mean it looks like totally unrecognizable in its shape, but in the, the way where he places the tribes, 
it seems to have been very, very accurate indeed. Uh, he did not show the wall because I'm not sure that it was uh, completed by the time he got his information. He got his information from a campaign that had been conducted in the north of Scotland uh, some years, some decades before under the Emperor Agricola uh, in the reign of Domitian, which was in the year 79 to 84. There were campaigns in Scotland and the worst tribe of them all were the Caledonii, who eventually gave their name to the whole country, Caledonia. Uh, that's one of the names of Scotland. Well, the new frontier is what you see here. It was not built of stone because there was no uh, convenient stone to build it with. And stone requires... Masons and there's a great deal more skillful, it needs a great deal more skill to build than a turf wall. I presume that the Romans were using local labor and there wasn't a talented lo local enough talented local labor in this part of Scotland amongst the tribes, if they could even trust the tribes, to build their wall for them. And so I think they relied on their own troops to build the stone, uh, the, the, the wall with turf. And so the turf wall with a ditch, you can see the ditch here. It's very walkable and it now is also a world historical site because they've joined the two, the Hadrian's Wall and the Antonine Wall as one uh, multiple um, um, world heritage site. It really is quite, um, quite a, a strenuous walk to walk a fair stretch of it. I'm showing you this aerial view because there is the line of the, the ditch. That's the ditch that you can see there on the left. I'm sorry, this thing is temperamental. Um, and then over here, uh, yeah, oops, barking. Uh, see, I've got another one in my pocket. We'll see if it's any better. Um, No, I've tried them both and they're, well, never mind. Um, I'll, I can point you to make that move. This is the, this part here is a, um, a fort and the headquarters building of the fort is there. And I might add that later in my career, long before I was, uh, long after I was born and had accumulated these genes of my ancestor, archaeological ancestor, um, uh, I'd excavated... Um, when I was at uh, the University of Edinburgh and in this corner here my job was to try and find out how the turf wall of the, um, this out here, the, uh, the actual wall itself, fitted into the turf wall of the, um, of the fort. The fort is called Rough Castle and it's a, one of the smaller forts. And so that's the, um, oh thank you. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> Good. So another view of it, you see this time a better, but as you see, it's, um, you know, they keep the grass down and it's not too, especially in summer, it's a very pleasant walk. You can walk a long way um, uninterrupted along the, um, the, this would be in the Roman Empire on this side and on the other side you would be outside the Roman Empire with a very deep ditch walking along the rampart there. And I show you where it goes over a hill. This is Croy Hill, and there is actually a fort just at the foot of this. It's the one place where they couldn't cut the rock. They, weren't, they didn't have the skills or the time to cut the rock, and they, they've made some attempt at it, but they gave up at that point. And there's a, a place also on Adrian's Wall where the Romans... They, 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 they weren't up to cutting the rock. It was far too um, tough for them. But there it goes. It continues up and down over hill and dale. Um, and this here is to illustrate that the wall was built on a base, a stone base. Because if you don't have a stone base which has drains at regular intervals, you're going to get a build-up of water on the, preferably on the outside if there is to be a build of water, but on the inside it would be disastrous because then you're getting all of the um, facilities, the, the um, military facilities on the inside cluttered up with water and all the rest of it. 
So this was always the way it was done. It also, from an archaeological point of view, it's invaluable because there's the kerb on each side and it gives us the width of the wall, the precise width of the wall. This actually runs through a modern cemetery in Bears Den, which is a, um, a suburb of modern Glasgow. You can see some of the... It's nothing, the Christian crosses have nothing to do with the, um, with the monument. Well... Um, in the 19th century, in, 19, in 1890, as I say, the Glasgow Archaeological um, Society undertook um, a massive project of excavating sections of the wall to try and clarify its construction and so forth. But these were different days from archaeology today. The um, scholars and the professor in Glasgow, uh, he didn't come to the site, he just engaged a local um, foreman, who was my um, grandfather's uncle, his name was James Russell, so we're namesakes, and he was engaged as a farmer who had used to dealing with labor and so forth on his farm, uh, to be the foreman of the excavations. He had no training at all in digging um, a, an ancient site, but he quickly got the, you know, the, the right man. He'd actually trained as a lawyer. I think he don't know quite what went wrong. I think he had a nervous breakdown or something. And he was, when he inherited the farm, I think he was much happier in the country. But um, he, so he was a man of some learning as well. Um, and, and he wrote an enormous amount of stuff, uh, including an astonishing account of his, um, of his grandfather, who had been a clergyman and had travelled an account of his visit to London. This is about in 1780 or 1770, I think, uh, which is quite hilarious. In fact, the Scotsman going to London was, uh, you know, and the, the troubles he had in the hotel, people, he was treated as a barbarian uh, in York, for instance, and he, it was somebody came to his rescue because he was very unpopular being a Scotsman. Mind you, that wasn't so long after the the Jacobite Rebellion, so no doubt Scots were not all that were suspect. <laughs> In any case, what he did was to, uh, he cut sections through the, uh, the rampart, that's the wall there, this is actually at Rough Castle, so there is a piece of wall here, but you can see the, um, you see these striations, these are actually the turfs, the, they cut turfs and laid them out, and then when the grass of the turf carbonized, you get the clear impression of the courses of turfs as they were laid. And so on, with that guidance, he had the bright idea of um, experimental archaeology. Let's build one of these and see what it looks like. We, because we know um, how wide it is, and so we'll try to build it up with turfs. So it's not going to go up straight because turfs, you know, the, the nature of building the turfs, you have to, um, it has to slope. You have to have um, uh, a slope and then the top will be narrower, has to be narrower than the base. And so he got his men, and this is him standing proudly in front of his, what he called his, um, his peat stack. Because, of course, in those days, uh, lots of Scots used peat rather than coal for fuel. And so and they stacked it up outside their houses. So this, was, this, is, his, this is James Russell's peat stack, and he's standing in front of it. Uh, and he figured out that it must have risen to about 10 feet. And, uh, um, sorry, yes, um, about 10 feet in height, and perhaps... Um, a certain width, which he figured had to be less than the width of the lower part, but enough to accommodate two men passing for a wall walk and also for there to be a palisade on top. And so he built this. And every, at the end of the week or in the part of the month when the, um, the members of the Glasgow Archaeological Society, they came out by train and he picked them up and brought them to the site and they had picnics and they heard the latest. And when they saw this, they were incredibly impressed and they wrote it up. His piece of experimental archaeology 
as a, an appendix in their report. And, um, and would you believe that the statistics for the, uh, the height and breadth of the, all the statistics of the wall, of this turf wall for the uh, Antonine wall have not changed from the figures that he has given. Nobody has had the, uh, the sense to have another go at this and have a closer look at it, perhaps in a more scientific way than this, because this was really, this they did, they did in their spare time. But that is an astonishing, to me, that is an astonishing neglect of, the, um, of modern scholarship, that they're taking the, uh, the report of, of the Glasgow Archaeological Society of 1890, and it's still the standard work, that the standard dimensions that are given. Anyway, I, th this has been repeated. If you go to Vindolanda on Hadrian's Wall, where the wall, part of the wall at that time was of turf, but it, on the Hadrian's Wall, the turf wall was eventually replaced in stone. And here they've done exactly the same thing. Um, and so that gives you an idea with the Palisades. So it gives us an idea of what uh, would have been the case if uh, James Russell had added a Palisade to his wall. So there's the cross-section of the Antonine Wall. That's how it worked with a ditch. And there was one other nasty feature which they found when they were excavating uh, in the uh, Glasgow um, excavations of 1890. They found outside the wall in this flat piece of ground in front of the wall, if somebody actually got across the ditch and got very close to the wall, there were these holes going down about oh, probably down about six feet, a whole series of them. And you'll note that they're staggered. They're not in straight lines. If you're coming across thinking you've now made it across the, um, the ditch, we're getting up to the wall, um, but this was all covered. You see, it would have been covered with moss or with um, turf and so forth, and there would be a, ni a nice spike sticking up from the bottom, like a tank trap or something like that. And so they would, you would end up right at the bottom with um, speared by whatever sharp spike was at the bottom. The Romans called these things, I don't know, the Romans have a strange sense of humor, but they called them lilies. Now, I suppose it does look like, they do look like lily pads when they're covered over, um, but certainly it's not a very attractive, uh, it's not an, a sweet thing like a lily is not suitable to me for the, um, the purpose that they were put to. And also, you'll notice here, the, um, every fort had its um, memorial slab. And remember, this wall is only going to last for 20 years. In 20 years, the Romans had given it up. Not because they were defeated at all. I think they just found it so difficult to hold because in winter, the lines of communication are long, and the winters in southern Scotland, which is very hilly indeed, uh, are often snow, snowy and so forth. And also, the local people would never be at peace. They would be constantly harassing the, um, the troops. They just felt that this wasn't worth holding on to. It was more trouble than it was worth. But, uh, and this left all these fine handsome stones recording the successful building of this wall, this one tells us that's the name of the emperor, Antoninus, um, the, the emperor Caesar, Titus, Aelius, Hadrian, Antoninus, Augustus, Pius, and then it tells us which regiment, in this case it's the second, region, the second regiment, the Augusta, um, stationed down at Kerwent in the south of Wales, which was a huge legionary camp, and then they give the length of space of paces, a thousand paces and four hundred and uh, four hundred no so four thousand and sixty three paces of wall that this particular contingent had um, uh, constructed and here are some more but when they left they didn't want these to get into enemy hands and they buried them all and they were buried until the 19th century when people started excavating them or discovering them and they became valuable things for museums and so forth 
and there are now about 15 of them all together and they're clustered in the Hunterian Museum at Glasgow University um, but of course they, that was the university that was sponsoring all this work and they really make a remarkable collection and it tells a lot about the, uh, how much the uh, Roman army wanted to commemorate its uh, successes and its activities even when it was building uh, its engineering um, activities. In this case here, this one is the one I like, this I think is um, Britannia perhaps, symbolizing Britannia and here is a standard bearer with his eagle and so forth bowing humbly before Britannia who see, or perhaps Roma herself thanking the, the legion which in this case is the 20th legion there's it's a detachment a vex of the leg of the 20th legion the Valeria Victrix they all had fancy names after and then the amount of um, uh, wall that's been constructed and this poor captive uh, two British captives uh, usually it's one female and one male with their hands tied behind their backs um, and but what I like is the there's a wreath that's being, I think it's a, intended to be a wreath being handed to the eagle, a victory wreath, but it looks more like a bagel. <laughs> <laughs> so eagles need bagels to keep. <laughs> now this is just, I throw in this just to illustrate the size of the Roman Empire. As I say, I've done a fair bit of traveling in, in distant places. That connect, and this place here, which is in Algeria, it's a large gravestone in the countryside, a rather desolate countryside in uh, central Algeria. I was there in the spring and I got stuck. I had my rented car got stuck and I had to get hauled out by villagers from close by. But I did get to, the, to see what my target was, which was this mausoleum, which is the mausoleum of a man called Lollius Urbicus, who was the commander-in-chief of the building of the Antonine Wall. On this remote northwest frontier of the empire, here is his, um, uh, is his mausoleum, not far from another frontier uh, on the Saharan south southern part of the empire, not that far from the, uh, from the southern frontier. Well, that's... All when I was growing up, even as a very small child, I was often taken to Rough Castle where I would eventually do a little bit of excavating. And um, even before I went to school, I was, this was dinned into me, this distinguished ancestor. And I, was, and I now have correspondence with the, which was, I found in the, when, from the family remains and so forth, between him and the Glasgow um, archaeological society and when I went to school I had a very distinguished uh, school to attend and this is the facade of the school which is now which is on the Colton Hill in Edinburgh if you know where that is there's the famous what is called Scotland's Disgrace it's a half finished Parthenon on the top of this hill which everybody asks about and it's right next to the huge uh, um, tower or um, that is Nelson's Monument and there's a ball that drops at one o'clock just like our 12 o'clock gun in Vancouver except this is a thing that well there is a 12 one o'clock gun but at the same time this ball drops from the top of the tower and that's at the top of the hill but this is the Royal High School and uh, it's a nice piece of um, Edinburgh neoclassical architecture from the period of the um, the Enlightenment towards the end of the Enlightenment and the building itself is modelled, I mean it's an absolutely precise model of the uh, Temple of Hephaestus in Athens. So that whether you liked it or not, you, were, you had classic, classical antiquity all around you when you were at school. And the classical education that I got was really second to none. I took both Latin and Greek. Uh, there and uh, benefited enormously from the teaching that I got but it, this always was part of the, the setting and it, didn't, and it didn't lapse when I went to university because there is the university from almost the same period and this is an Adams building 
uh, one of the Adams brothers who are famous not only in Scotland but in London uh, in that period when neoclassical architecture was very much in vogue. Uh, they did not include the dome. The dome came a hundred years later but the facade of that building which is the main the entrance to the old quad as it's called the original university building no not the original the original was um, in a different place but uh, this one was built in the 18th century when people said, felt during the Scottish Enlightenment that Scotland's universities should look like universities and not be humble buildings and so and I Actually, uh, our classics library was up in the dome. Uh, it was a, but that was where the classics library was. It was a, and there was no elevators or anything. You know, they climbed right up about seven, many flights of stairs up to there. So uh, all of these things were sort of clearly having their effect on me as I was growing up. And uh, then when I came to Canada with introducing the... Um, a classical archaeology to the University of Manitoba. Um, I just had a, you know, an undergraduate MA because the there is the BA didn't doesn't exist in the Scottish universities. It's the Master of Arts. It's the first degree that you get. Although it's a four in my case, it was a four-year degree. And um, so when I was at the University of Manitoba, I had a wonderful colleague, a Cockney who took me under his wing, very brilliant man, who ended up as a um, professor at Harvard. And he advised me that when I said I would be enjoying it in Manitoba, I would like to stay, because the original intention was really to stay for two or three years and then go back to Scotland. But uh, I really liked the place and um, getting to, well, I mean, not the weather, but the students. <laughs> and, and so he took me aside and I said, now look here, Jim. You're thinking of staying at this university or any university in North America. You've got to get yourself a PhD. So I said, well, where do I get a PhD? I, I sort of mimicked his speech. And uh, he said, well, there's hundreds of places. So I spent ages writing for calendars. And I got these calendars and I couldn't... I couldn't make up my mind. They seemed to be a plethora of courses. Each university had huge, like ours, the calendar is full of courses. Well, it doesn't say it. Most of these courses, or many of them, are never offered, or they're offered once in every <laughs> ten years. And I, I thought there must be huge faculties in these places. And it was only after a while this was explained that that wasn't, you know, this didn't mean... In any case, I was so perplexed. And then... Uh, George to the rescue again. He said, look at Will and Ed. They were the two other colleagues. They had both gone to Chicago. And he said, now look at Will. They're both superb scholars and they're fine gentlemen. Wouldn't you agree? And I did agree. And he said, well, there can't be much wrong with Chicago. And so I'm wearing my Chicago sweater here <laughs> to make the point that that's where I went. And they were right. The, the advice was perfect. And it was while I was there that I had the opportunity as a student to go to the site that you see here. And this is not in Scotland, as you might say, from the <laughs> weather looks good and all the rest of it. Um, but this is on the Saronic Gulf of the, um, the Gulf of Corinth, uh, or the Isthmus of Corinth. Uh, this is the high uh, acrocorns or a spur of it in the distance that you see here. But this bay was actually the port of Kinkriai, which is mentioned in the New Testament. It's mentioned as the, in the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, St. Paul actually left for Ephesus from this port. It doesn't look like much like a port in the, as you see it here. This is a, just a beach. But I spent a year, uh, um, a season there, excavating... Um, and enjoyed it immensely. There is the, an aerial view of the, the port. And I want you to have a look at this stuff here. This is all underwater today, but at one time it was, this was a, um, a quay with um, warehouses on it and also a particularly interesting building up towards the end of it, um, an apsidal-shaped building. 
And uh, I only worked there for one year, and I had a taste of an, a kind of archaeology that I disliked. It was underwater archaeology, <laughs> because a lot of the exploration and surveying of this could only be done underwater, and it was by using a snorkel and so forth, and then diving down and taking the measurements and so forth. And you would think this is the life of Riley in, this, in the Mediterranean, all morning longs, swimming in the, in the hot sun and so forth. Well, first of all, water does get cold. And if you think that even the Mediterranean, if you're in there for two and a half hours or any length of time, it becomes bitterly cold. And what was worse, the sun was shining on top of me and being a very fair-skinned Scot like most, I got sunburned and my first, you know, after about two days, I was out of, you know, I was out for about another two days till I got over this severe sunburn. And then, of course, I always had to have something on the back of my head. So this was the first time I'd experienced extreme uh, sunlight, and uh, which you certainly don't get in Scotland. Well, the, um, what we had to do then, as I say, was to swim ar around measuring um, walls. Some of it, this part here at the front was the um, a church and um, the Apsidal building at the rear. I, I may be wrong here because I missed out to the, the full. I only did one season here. But here is the plan. This is the port. This is the pier here that I'm talking about with the, the warehouses um, on this side and the other part of the site that was excavated was a large, not sure that it's ever been identified what it actually was used for but it seems to have been a large building, possibly a public building but it, it does seem to also have, it's just mosaic pavements as well, it does seem to have served as some kind of um, uh, residential purposes as well so these are the two um, buildings, these are the two absidal buildings. One of them was a church and the other one was something mysterious and that was all done by underwater archaeology. Now as I say, at the, to do the warehouses which were, in, which were quite inshore, close to the shore, it was possible to do it by snorkeling um, and later the work was all done by scuba diving and with my colleague Hector Williams over here, he actually was involved in this work uh, some seasons later. I think two, two seasons later, if I'm not mistaken, Hector, was it? Uh, 68. 68, yes. By that time, it was all being done um, scuba diving. And the results were quite spectacular. Um, first of all, by that time it was possible to produce you know, a fairly confident um, view of what the quayside would have looked like with the various warehouse buildings. Um, and this was the building that they had to be um, shored up when important material was found in it. There were slabs of um, what we could all might call um, solid stained glass. Um, glass applied to plaster on the back but of colours and all sorts of interesting scenes some of them representing Alexandria in fact identifiable scenes of um, street scenes of Alexandria the very very important city in the Roman Empire uh, but some of them there is the work going on now it's pumps are in and so forth and it's, it's possible to drain it but these slabs were piled up against the wall uh, as if they were either being dismantled or as if they were being brought in to be applied to the walls. It's, I'm not sure that it was ever established which. And one of the, I'll just show you one of these here, um, the, the, the very poor condition and the conservation of these, th of these um, glass slabs uh, was an absolute nightmare and many of them are still not fully conserved or even on display but there seems to have been some um, scenes that depicted important uh, figures from, Roman lit from Greek literature because this is Homer here, identified as Homer, and there was also Plato as well, as I recall. Um, but that was another excavation that I had the privilege of working on as a, a student. Um, and fast, fast forward, but also involving students, we now come to another part of the Roman Empire, 
what the Romans called um, Syria Palestine, southern Syria, which they identified, uh, qualified by Palestine, of which of course is more familiar to us today as Jordan and Israel. This is the Dead Sea here. And the excavation was in the uh, Sea of Galilee, at far up the Jordan, the Jordan Valley, the very deep Jordan Valley is here. And that was an interesting um, expedition, which involved uh, several institutions, a Rhone, UBC, um, an odd so assortment of institutions, and how I got into it was interesting. Um, it was the British School in, of Archaeology in Jerusalem, that asked me if I would be interested in looking at an excavation at Capernaum, Capernaum as it's called, or Capernaum, famous in the um, scriptures as the home of uh, the apostles Peter and uh, Andrew and also James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Um, and uh, so I thought this was quite interesting. I, I was already, I was still involved in Anamorium. I really, I thought, it, but it would be a nice opportunity to look at the site anyway and give them some opinion. And so I went there and it turned out that it was, the excavation was going full blast and it was the um, second director or the director in charge of excavations and surveys of the Israeli um, Antiquity Service who was directing a field school for a consortium of uh, colleges and uh, universities in the States. Um, and he had asked the British school if they would like to join this. Well, I didn't think it was appropriate for a, you know, a senior academic institution like the British school, which is really a full-blown graduate type research institution to be involved with something that was primarily a teaching school for undergraduates. Um, on the other hand, I was so taken with the site and with the um, Vasilius Tsaferis' um, personality and so forth, and he emphasized that this is not as many of these field schools in the uh, Middle East tend to be using students as heavy labor. They just use them as cheap labor, and, and this is quite a notorious practice. Uh, there was none of that. It was, emphasis was on teaching. When anything interesting happened, work was suspended, and everybody was gathered around to get instruction on the subject. And there were lectures, there were tours at the weekend to the various sites in the vicinity, a, a mid-season mid expedition to Jerusalem. And uh, so that's what um, this was all about. And I show you a general view looking down towards um, Capernaum in this view here. Uh, there are some of the sites. Kfarnahum is here, the Mount of Beatitudes, all sorts of famous places. The Chapel of the um, Beatitudes down below. And also um, further on was the... Um, youth hostel that we stayed at which was just down here Keria can I see Keria Dasha I think it was shown on that map anyway we stayed in a youth hostel right on the lake and were taken in buses at five in the morning because we worked in the morning and then were finished at one o'clock because of the terrific heat in this site which is well below sea level uh, so that's where the site is located and excavations had been conducted there for many, many years by the Franciscan fathers who are, have the title uh, Custodia Terrae Sanctae, the custody of the Holy Land. And so many of the archaeological sites, in uh, Christian sites that is, in the Holy Land are under their supervision. And so there is... Uh, monastery there, a Catholic monastery, and their excavations have uh, been going for many, many years. Uh, and on the other side of that wall, this is very typical of, um, of the Holy Land, uh, the, the Patriarchate of Jerusalem, the Orthodox, they too have a corner on the Holy Site, and there is a wall between them, and these walls are as... Uh, 
hostile as the Berlin Wall. These two do not speak to each other. And so the Orthodox, the Patri Patriarchate of Jerusalem, in, uh, th th were annoyed that Orthodox Christians were joining the bus tours to visit this site here. And why could we not have um, something that we could show our people? And they wouldn't have to go to visit this synagogue here, which is mentioned in the scriptures, and also to visit the house of Peter. Surely there must be something we can come up with. Uh, can we not just dig? No, you can't just dig. You have just to be authorized by the state and so forth. And that's how Vasilius Zaferis, who himself had been a monk, and had married and become an archaeologist and so forth, but was still good friends with his old um, comrades in the, um, in, the, in the monasteries where he had served and with the Patriarchate. And so this uh, consortium had been set up with students. There is the uh, Orthodox Church, <coughs> and I show you now the two uh, sites side by side. You can see how extensively excavated the uh, Catholic site is, the Roman Catholic site, and that is the um, synagogue, almost certainly, the one that was paid for by a centurion when his uh, servant had been cured of a, a fatal disease and so forth. And that house there is attributed to the home of Peter because it's full of graffiti where pilgrims have, you know, asked for Peter's help and so forth um, so that there is authority for it being Peter's house. But I, I doubt very much if one could go further than that. But, but there's certainly, this is a very holy site. It has now been obliterated in a sense because... There is a huge big chapel on top of it which has completely concealed it and so now you have to go underneath the under trappings of this uh, chapel to, um, uh, to get into the archaeological zone underneath. The antiquities, um, the Israeli government put their foot down but of course then they confronted the Vatican and the Vatican insisted and rather weakly they capitulated and said uh, there was terrific furore about it. So that's an old photograph. On the other side of the wall, you can see the beginnings of our excavations. Uh, this turned out to have nothing that was going to produce relics, except perhaps in one rather dubious case. Um, but it was primarily... Um, an Arab village that we were excavating, though underneath the Arab village there was earlier uh, material and I had the good luck to be part of that um, in our area. This then is the, yes, I'll just show you, that's the house of Peter and that's the synagogue. And I might mention that the road, the main road north to, between Jerusalem and Damascus goes right at the back of this site heading for the crossing of the Jordan and there are milestones and there are also mausoleums. There's a mausoleum of, a, uh, of an important official, Roman official, very close to this road that runs behind here. So this is a pretty strategic site in fact. And now we'll take you around to the entrance to the um, Patriarchate. Monastery is a holy place. The entrance will be admitted, etc., only, under, only with cover. You've got to cover your head, of course. And so that's, um, so this is the, the Greek area. And there's the lovely little uh, church where on one occasion uh, we had a liturgy, the prior of the um, church of the Holy, uh, of Mount Tabor came down from his monastery and we had a lovely thing in which our um, Vasilius, who had been, of course, a, a monk, he sang the liturgy so beautifully. It was just, it was all a surprise to us. He, it was uh, quite a special event, in fact. And so this is the opening of the excavation on one. It, it lasted for four years. We had a contingent, usually of about 10 students from UBC, um, who, um, it was for them, it was a great experience, of course. Not just the excavation and being in Israel, but also 
meeting these other students from quite different kinds of universities. We had students from Notre Dame University, the premier Catholic university of, um, of America. I mean, they were really preppy types, very, very, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, upper class types. And then there were our students who were solid public universities. Then we had um, from Pepperdine University. I don't know if you've heard of Pepperdine University, but it's uh, in Malibu and is famous for its um, surfing as a subject. You can do graduate work in surfing and all sorts of other things like that. And so they were flaxen haired, beautiful people from the Los Angeles district. And then there was another one crowd from um, Abilene, Texas. And this was a very um, conservative Christian um, group, um, very, very serious, where the poor um, representative there, he was in loco parentis, so that he had to keep an eye on his children in a way that we didn't. Our students, you know, were free to, you know, get off and have fun and generally enjoy themselves, but not his crowd. They were, um, and, 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 and the only thing was that when our lot got into some nonsense, uh, we were supposed to police them, and uh, we had one guy who was senior student he was in his 40s, great big fellow, and he had come to university late. He wanted to get some learning, a big, big fellow and strong as an ox. He had been in the construction industry, and, and he, was, he could do the work of three of the other regular students, except once in a while he went in a bender and would arrive back at the hostel, um, you know, a bit loud and uproarious and... Um, and I was supposed to police this, you see. This was what I was expected to do. Well, I said, well, let's see how he does tomorrow. If he does a full day's work, I can't say anything. Of course, he did a full day's work and three times what anybody else was doing. And this it happened twice. And each time I, I said, I couldn't, I can't take action. I'm not prepared to take action unless he fails to do his job. And he goes out, he's not bothering anybody, really. He was a bit loud when he got back, but he wasn't aggressive or anything. Anyway, that was the sort of situations you run into. That's part of the site that we were working on. I'll just show you a general action um, view people at their various activities. That's the Berlin Wall that separates us from the, um, uh, from the uh, Franciscans. But at this time, it's quite early in the season. Eventually, however, we expose this building, which is not complete because it runs under the wall. And uh, on many occasions, we would see the Franciscans looking out over the wall to see what we had on our side, to see if they should be digging on, on their side. Um, uh, but they, they never we would have invited them round and we were prepared to show them everything but no they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't agree to that at all anyway it turned out to be a bath building um, oh yeah, I'll show you some of the usual activities and you might recognize um, um, uh, Eric de Bruun in, uh, helping to hold the ladder for the photographer and um, and surveying scenes of surveying this is me in my yellow hat to uh, keep the sun off and so forth and we're talking about the and that's another from I think that's um, uh, one of our uh, sessional teachers uh, now a sessional teacher um, and the work continuing there again so I won't I believe in that so this is the building that we were excavating here and you see it's a sequence of rooms which continue further on so we've no idea I don't think there's an awful lot but I would expect there to be a furnace a prifornium as it's called to heat these two rooms which were heating so this is a bath building uh, in what uh, of the Roman period or at least late Roman period in amongst a whole series of other buildings which were many of them were uh, much later from the Umayyad period uh, in other words, from the first um, period of Arabic um, occupation in these parts. And so this was interesting, and there was some indication also that of military presence in this part of the site. And so we have a hunch that uh, this part of Capernaum, 
was um, somehow connected with the Roman military because most, you know, uh, one would expect a mikvah, uh, uh, the type of bath that's used by um, in the Judaic um, religion, uh, but they're just it's, it's tanks, really. It's not the full, you know, the cold room, the mild room, and then the hot room, and, or, the, or the dressing room, in fact, with all the apparatus of a Roman. And, of course, that was obvious when we started to find these tiles. These are the hypocaust. These are for the, uh, the, the pillars that hold up the floor for the heat to go on underneath um, and, of course, it has its own set of excellent drains. These are the drain covers here to take the water off. Um, so, altogether, it's a, a most interesting little building. And the fact of its, um, you know, its whole style, it's a linear type of bath that is very typical of what one finds in um, Roman forts in as far afield as Scotland, in fact. There's one or two good examples there. But it was a teaching um, uh, excavation, and I appreciated um, Vasilius Tzaferis' um, emphasis on that, that whenever anything happened, uh, for instance, we found one or two graves, work ceased at some important part in the process of its digging, and everybody was gathered around. We were shown how to uh, uh, excavate graves, also, every day at one o'clock, the last activity was we all gathered round and pottery sorting was conducted and the pottery and then the pottery from important pottery from the day before was laid out with, you know, it was all identified and so forth. There are pieces of lamps, for instance, uh, all of the things, the different um, types of um, objects, because Pottery only comes in fragments, of course. Very rarely do you get a complete object from an excavation. And, of course, the sheer beauty of the place was very, very attractive to the students, both by day when they would, could go swimming in the morning. They lunched on the quay, and then we all went back. A bus took us back to the hostel at 1.30 or 2, and then we all went to sleep for the afternoon because it was extremely hot. But that's a nice little shot that I took of a fishing boat just going out on the Sea of Galilee, just as it would have done in uh, 2,000 years before. Well, the last site I want to mention, I hope we're doing for time, I'm a bit um, uh, pushing it a bit here, um, but I'll do it quite quickly. It's our own UBC excavation in Turkey, in a part of Turkey, uh, southeast Turkey, um, not far from Antioch, which is in Syria. Uh, um, no, sorry, it was the capital of Syria. It's still in Turkey today, but uh, Syria, ancient Syria, is down in here, in this uh, part here. So this is in the southeast corner. It's best uh, described as immediately opposite Cyprus. It's the southernmost point of this coast, the southern coast. It's called Anemurium, and which just means it's the Greek word for windy point. And uh, it sure lived up to its name when we lived there. I mean, the wind there could whip up, especially at night, when it would, we, we, we slept on the point, right on the promontory. And it was like being in a, in a ship that was the creaking of the doors and the full... It seemed to be creaking on its foundations all the time. You might notice some important cities that are probably immediately recognizable. Ephesus, of course, Ankara. But they're long, they're of long distance. Pergamon, a very important city in the Hellenistic period particularly. And, of course, Antioch, the capital city of ancient um, Syria. And Konya, Iconium, um, which was uh, in the center, visited by Paul on his journeys. And Tarsus also, his, um, of which he was a native. So there, just to give you, this is an aerial view of my courtesy of satellite photograph. That's the northwest corner of um, Cyprus, and that's Point Anamur right there, projecting there. And that uh, pinkish color uh, indicates alluvial plain, which accounts for um, the size of a fairly prosperous city there, uh, town to, there today. A very large plain, very fertile, grows uh, tomatoes. It's 
ahead of the market. The, um, uh, they're shipped up to Istanbul and all over Europe because they get the earliest tomatoes, they get the earliest lettuce they, um, because they have a wonderfully mild climate in winter. And the site there is strung along the coast. Um, this is this, it's facing south, that promontory, with a wall which is medieval, which housed a castle on top that belongs to, belonged to um, the Armenian um, people who came after the defeat of the Armenians at the Battle of Manzikert at the end of the 11th century. They moved down into Cilicia, into this part of Turkey, and policed and, and more or less occupied it or ruled it for a period in the kingdom of little Armenia. But what we see strung along there is the Roman city. You can see the uh, aqueduct at the rear here, and these are all public buildings of various kinds. Our excavation house was a coast guard station right on the point there, uh, overlooking the beach. That's a view looking down on the city. It's a city of no great history. It, it did... Uh, it did get involved in a bit of a crisis in the, um, uh, in, in the first century when it was besieged by, um, uh, well, I think tribal hill types, just very like the Caledonians, I think. These hill tribes were a menace to the um, more peaceful people living on the coast, and uh, they had to build a huge wall uh, to protect it. And that we know because it's mentioned in the uh, historian Tacitus. But otherwise it's a city without much history, occasionally mentioned. And what we know of it is largely from our own excavations and from inscriptions that we find on the site and from the pottery and from the coins that we have discovered in the course of excavation seasons, which began in 19... They began actually in the 1960s. The original excavator was... Uh, a very distinguished scholar from the University of Toronto. So it's always been a Canadian um, operation. She dug it from 1966 to 70, and then um, she passed it on to the University of British Columbia, um, which it has been, whose responsibility has been ever since. Not just excavating, but conservation, and now um, process of publishing. There are already many publications, I mean, both reports and um, books. There's the uh, pottery has been published, the um, mosaics have been published, the, the mosaic inscriptions have been published, and much else in the course of the reports has appeared. Um, so that's what the site looks like. Uh, the, the hillside comes down very steeply, and the hillside is occupied by um, tombs, and these lines here, that's the line of the uh, aqueduct, which is going to feed a bath here, a bath building. This is a huge bath building here. You'll notice that it has a fairly long history because eventually churches, Christian churches, start to appear, four of them, um, uh, all of which we have excavated to some degree. There's a theatre there, a little odium, still standing. It's lost its roof, but its windows are still in place, at least you know, you can see where they were, and its interior is um, quite, uh, you know, it's, it's still used, in fact, by the local community. They, they put um, wood, wooden um, forms down for the, the seating, and the stage is covered over. It's, there's a hole in the stage, and they have concerts there in the season. And this great big building is a massive bath building, which we excavated and restored to some extent, you see the outlines of it. The main entrance is up at this end here where there's a huge uh, exercise yard or palaestra and one comes through into the, um, uh, into the building uh, at this point here because there's a coal tank. This is the, the cold end of the, the building. The, this part of the building, these three rooms are all heated. So these are various degrees of heat. This is a uh, cold room with a huge um, bathing pool. I wouldn't call it a swimming pool. It's not really deep enough to swim properly. And then there's another smaller room, but uh, this has been added. So one wonders whether it's added, perhaps trying to provide facilities for both men and women. That's one possibility. 
but it may just be an overflow. But it is another little um, um, pool there as well. There is the large pool with steps in the corner, fed by um, by an aqueduct, which I suspect was built specifically to feed this huge bath. And all of this material here, all of this is mosaic. Much of it has broken, broken off, but you can see areas where the mosaic is still in place. I should say, however, and this illustrates the problems that one has in ex any excavation, you run into administrative problems. Um, we had hardly started when um, one local chap came around and said we couldn't dig any longer. This was his field. And, uh, well, that was a pretty serious thing. We had already started and so forth, and he was going to put a stop to us digging. And so he went in, and the um, judge of the neighborhood, he put um, an injunction on our activities in that particular field, which would where all, all of our effort had been concentrated but he said he would uh, deliberate he would have to take evidence and so forth and to our surprise rather than call us into his chambers he comes out to the site and in, a, um, in this apsed hall here which is the end of a large covered hall which almost certainly was the town basilica where such things would have happened in the past, the, the judgments would be delivered from the, the top end of the basilica. So that was where he was doing his um, deliberations. Here he is in the centre, the court stenographers bashing away over... Oh, no, there's a court stenographer here, bashing away an old um, a typing machine here. And meanwhile, the... Um, the owner is uh, over here, um, immediately behind our representative, because on any Turkish excavation, we are required to have a representative from the Department of Antiquities, usually somebody from a local museum, though in this case, he was a, a representative actually sent by them from Ankara itself. So he was at headquarters, though he shortly afterwards became the director of his own museum and eventually rose to become Director of Antiquities. Um, so we were well represented. And then I'm keeping low, my, keeping a very low profile in the corner here. I'm keeping out of it, let, let it all be sorted. So we were called in a week later and were relieved to discover that um, because we were discovering antiquities underneath this field, they belonged to the state. What we had uncovered proved that there were antiquities and therefore uh, so he was deprived of the use of that field. Um, he was sorry for him. Our workman, he was a landlord to many of our workmen and was a bit of a gouger and so forth. And so they were quite happy and were rejoiced that he had lost. Well, that's the field actually that the quarrel was all about. This field is still overgrown. Uh, you can see some evidence of excavation here where a uh, mosaic has been uncovered. But in the end, everything from there to the whole, the whole field turned out to be paved in mosaic. There it is. That's it after excavation. This here would have been where you see this um, hole here. This would have been a stone platform, a low sto stone platform for the support of a colonnade which would have gone all the way around that, that um, um, mosaic floor. And that would have been called the palaestra. The building that you see here was added later after the building had gone out of use. This became used for other purposes. There was a period, we think, when it was even used as a parade ground for the military because we found lots of... of um, of low value coins in great numbers as if the soldiers were you know and I, I, in earth the earth that had accumulated on the surface of the, the mosaic and all from the same period when we know that there was a military regiment stationed there at the end of the fifth um, at the end of the sorry the end of the fourth century 
And so one of the interesting mosaics, which I think will amuse, um, this is just the point where you leave the um, building when you've been through the, uh, the cold room and the medium uh, tepid room and then the hot room, the caldarium, and then maybe going back in for a douche in, the, um, in, the, in this pool again. And then you come out and this announces to you in Greek, Kalosalusu, you've had a nice bath. Well, then we found at the very entrance to the building, oh, there it is, In uh, that's a drawing of it. Um, it was later, the mosaic was later, I think, um, broken into because this eventually became a latrine because there would have been wooden seats placed across here and there's a drain under here. So, uh, and I don't think that would have been the case uh, when... Um, it's difficult to establish for sure, but I, I think that came later than the, um, the, the inscription. It doesn't seem quite appropriate for the uh, to put a... Well, then, at the very entrance, the following year, we found a broken-off inscription, but enough to see it's exactly the same letters, Cal, um, and the beginning of that same type of omega, uh, the, the W kind of omega, and then the beginning of the same again. And then it's been replaced. There's a repair in here. This says, Kalos Lusai, which means, do have a nice bath. So right at the entrance. And so we've got both the entrance to this building and the, the exit to, to the baths. So that would have been the entrance right there, you see, in the middle of the, that was a rather spacious hall uh, in front of the, the baths proper. Then you would come out here, I think, into the um, corridor uh, that went right round and then down a stately doorway and there would be a large entrance onto what probably was a colonnaded street. We never actually confirmed the presence of a colonnaded street for certain in, uh, along this line here. And an inscription here that was dedicated to a chap who'd won uh, five times uh, in the Olympic Games, the Nemean Games, and he, he seems to have been a real um, star athlete, he, his um, inscription. And the last thing I'll show you here is the, the, the graveyard. The, this looks like a whole lot of little um, uh, Quonset huts or Nissen huts rising up the hillside. They're vaulted tomb chambers with um, two-roomed tomb chambers libations for pouring offerings to the dead uh, who are buried in the tomb uh, behind and in that same tomb and I'll just show you the layout of the tomb that was the where we that's where the libation step was which you would have reached by staircase into that part of the tomb. This is at lower level uh, in which uh, the tomb paintings are well preserved, though uh, covered with um, the accretions of lime that has seeped through from the um, mortar from the roof above and caused a film that you can, so that you can barely see the details. And that's where our conservators come in. We had conservators in the early days from... Uh, the Institute of Archaeology at London University, London College, at um, the University College London, top-rate um, conservators, both the, the leader and the students. Uh, and then, latterly, uh, the Institute of, uh, an Institute of Conservation was set up at Queen's University and we were able to um, have... Um, conservators from that program and so we, we had our own Canadian uh, conservators doing this work which is very very painstaking it, it involves working in really quite poor conditions you know they're not well ventilated and also they're dark we had to use mirrors to catch the light to bring the light in and so forth and it involves just paring away this film without damaging the painted um, surface of the painting underneath. And they're on ladders because they're high up the painting. And the end result 
is quite astonishing. There are not many Roman, I mean, Roman paintings, plenty of Roman mosaics, they survive because they're made of stone and so forth, but painting often disappears and the, the accumulation of paintings found in these tombs, which have been published by uh, my predecessor as director, Elizabeth Alfoldi, um, this is a very precious um, collection of paintings. They represent, in this case, the seasons represented in two forms. One form is with a wreath um, here that you see. Um, and this is winter. You can see he's all wrapped up, um, this fellow. And he's got his pruning hook here. And it's actually identified for us. You can probably make out the lettering there, but it's just the Greek word for winter. And then on this side, it's a Cupid figure who's got a sickle in hand and is bringing the harvest in because in this very hot part of the Mediterranean, the harvest comes in uh, in late June and early July. And so this is Theros. This is, um, this is summer. And so there are four of these um, panels, the square panels representing the four seasons and four of the roundels representing the four seasons. And I think that's where I brought it to an end. I thought that was uh, long enough. In fact, I've almost spent my time. But, um, so that gives a, an account of how I came from the, my genes at the beginning <laughs> right up to um, the project that still lives with me and with others as well, present, both um, um, Hector and... Um, his wife who's, who's with us also who has completed largely her share, she did the pottery and Hector works on the lamps and was a photographer, virtually all the ph photographs you saw were the work of um, Hector uh, Hector Williams and Caroline is um, the pottery person, I do coins and small finds and others do um, lots of other things so that we have a team that's still hard at work sure thank you No, we, we continued to, uh, in fact, the latest work, I, the last season I had was in 2006. Everything is now conservation. No, no excavation has taken place since the 1980s. What we try to do now is to preserve the mosaics. In fact, when people find mosaics, I say, bury them, because they are a headache. Um, they disintegrate quite fast and you have to take and they're very expensive because the the conservation involves very meticulous treatment and so forth and we've got a top rate person now who is um, Kent Severson who is now unfortunately he's left the archaeological business he's now I think the curator I think he's the chief man in the museum in, uh, in Honolulu um, but he is just fantastic and so that's, that's the major work that goes on uh, now and uh, the, the, anything that's under lock and key for instance the tombs they're fine but anything that's open you know, everybody wants a piece of a tessera nobody will miss this wee bit piece of, of um, stone coloured stone and the tourists come round uh, remember one of these um, Tours from England that have forgotten the name of the ship. What's the name of the. the, it's the old Pardon? The one with Sir Martin Yes. What, was that the name of the ship? Yeah, 71. 71. Yeah, all this crowd of well to do um, travellers from Britain. It was a very famous um, club that they belonged to, and they came and we had everything laid out with our notebooks so they could see everything and the trenches were all level because of course we didn't want to appear in the next edition of how not to dig uh, you know and so forth everything was perfect and they came round and you know and every one of them they wanted a mosaic a, a fragment of a tessera 
you know, if everybody t that comes here takes a tessera, it won't be long, the, the mosaic is gone. That's the end of the mosaic. But they just, they were lusting for souvenirs like that. And so um, this one has to... Um, so what we've done now is we've buried them uh, quite deep. And also there's a kind of geotextile which is on top of them. And that discolours into the colour of soil. Uh, and so that, because they start scrambling around, and then they come to, oh, this is very hard. This is, this is packed hard, this soil. That's what we hope. And I think it's lucky. The latest I have is that the, the ones that we've done most recently have, uh, nobody's been poking around and, you know, trying to dig down to, to get a piece of mosaic. But I can show you, especially from the inscriptions, we've lost letters from some of the inscriptions from the, the churches. I showed you four churches. I didn't show any of that. But they have mosaic floors with all sorts of details, uh, information about, uh, you know, p p dedications and so forth. And also, uh, in fact, a splendid one of the peaceful kingdom with the... the um, a goat uh, or a kid and um, uh, what is it? it's, a la it's a panther it, it's confronting it and that's the pa and the passage the actual passage from scripture from Isaiah is actually in Greek above it and that one's entire that one's still okay but one of the dedications uh, and it was a military man that's why we think the military were there and this was probably um, officers who had become Christians and that this was the, the garrison church you see this was outside the city walls and two or three letters of his name are gone now and we would not have been able to construct his rank if, if they had not been there when, when it was discovered so that's the real um, hazard that we have with um, especially mosaics for some reason or another the, the it's those English yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. When you see why the Pope want to excavate Peter's house, I suppose it would seem perfectly understandable in 1957 that a classical archaeologist would want to excavate classical sites. Presumably, by the other end of your career, people will be giving to us classical archaeologists the rationales for classical archaeology for classical archaeology, not just for excavating the past, for doing history. One can always challenge historians to explain themselves. But for doing classical archaeology, for privileging those levels, and for this whole institutional um, superstructure whereby Canadian universities have portions of the Holy Land and portions of the Mediterranean uh, into land more generally, which get passed down over generations. You know, by the time PowerPoint came along, you guys were getting called on this. I'm just curious to know what the current answer might be. What's the rationale for carrying on with this enlightenment, well, classical practice academically? Well, of course, it's a, it's a very real question, and uh, there's one that is archaeologists address and uh, usually it's in the form of um, the working relationship with the, uh, the nation that is the host nation and I think that I think it would vary from country to country I think there are probably some countries that are perhaps in less developed countries where the uh, you know the attitude would be that you know this is something that more like the Victorian style of just going in, it's our privilege to go in, or like Henry Schliemann just going in and digging up Troy, that sort of thing. But I think now there is really a collegial uh, style in the, certainly uh, we have actually a, a, a Turkish um, scholar in our midst here, and I think he would uh, recognize that the, the whole, that it's, it's changed uh, considerably from even the earlier days when it did have something of the flavour of us coming in and um, taking over. But even by then, the, the Turks were extremely proud and 
conscientious in their own archaeology. And there's no question now that many of these countries, especially Turkey, the quality of archaeology is, I would say, better uh, in many cases, especially in prehistoric uh, fields, better than anything that, uh, that you would find in Canada. They're really very, very thorough and very, very, um, you know, absolutely up to the mark, I would say. So there isn't any feeling, I think, of... Um, the, the Turks are very generous, and they, but they do have a good system, and which is very strict. And, of course, the, uh, it takes a long time to get a permit, and some people, again, get exasperated and get annoyed, and they, they will be angry and so forth. You know, too, against the officials who are, you know, not delivering the permit. And my answer to them is, is just calm down, calm down. It will come, and the Turks themselves go through precisely the same process. Everybody is held to the same standards and held to the same process. So you, you don't feel you're being victimized because it's happening to everybody. Everybody has to go through this process. It can be very annoying to be, you know, waiting with, you know, people sitting, not being able to get on with their work. But this is how it's done, and, and one just accepts that it is. No, I don't think that it is in, in some, I think it, the attitude is still there, of course, in some minds, but it's not really like that anymore. And there's, there's a real um, sort of collegiality, and it's enhanced also by the Turks, who do something which no other country does. They have annually a symposium of the year's work, and you are obliged, if you have a permit, you will not, it will not be renewed unless you appear at that symposium and give a report, and that report must be uh, ready for publication in the proceedings of that symposium. And, and that's where everybody becomes friends. We get to know everybody in that, that, those symposiums. I, think, I don't think there's any country that has, any nation that has such an orderly way of reporting I know that many countries, uh, you know, Italy, people will dig and dig and dig, um, and many of the, the most sophisticated countries. Britain is, is, is a terrible case. There's excavations that go on and on and will never appear. That's not likely to happen in Turkey. At least a report, a, a, you know, a, a, an extensive report for each year. Final reports are a different story. That's, there's no control over that. But the, the, the actual report, but the actual reports are, the final report is really just the accumulation of the, uh, the interim report. Any other questions for Jim? Restore good money at a time. Can someone provide a collect for a, a next month, which is Diane and Laurie talking about a career working in China. So it should be absolutely fascinating. And Mark wants to make that announcement about next week? Yes. We're really, we're really out of time for questions. Well, it is 6.30. Okay. Um, is next week, um, at this time, Tuesday at 5 o'clock, uh, we have Joan Creeper, who uh, is a professor at the Center for Studies and Religion at Society at the University of Victoria. Um, he has written a string of important books on religions east, religions west, religions indigenous, spirituality and religion. Um, he's given a presentation called Why Do We Still Perceive All Religions Through a Christian Lens? Um, even in the most interdisciplinary and progressive kinds of scholarly practice, at least in our North American and our Western universities. And he's proposing he uh, presents as an alternative approach to understanding religion. Um, so that's uh, next week, five o'clock in the I'm sure that you all have questions for Jim. He'll be around, but you're invited to reception in the piano room inside, um, and Jim will come along, won't you? Yes. Uh, we'll be there. Yeah. Yeah. So, Jim, on behalf of all of us, I really want to thank you for an amazing perspective and overview. Thank you.